that came from other elements uh, within the within the battalion. And then even my platoon sergeant, you know, he came from 175 and 175 was very different back then. Um, you know, and they changed our mentality. You know, one of the, you know, and I've, you know, I talk about him all the time. Josh Wheeler was my squad leader and he was always pounding in our head like, hey, every training, every time we do PT, every single thing that we do, we need to do it like it's the last time before we go to war. It wasn't because he had this premonition. It's just he knew that that was the job of the military. Like, we got to be prepared at all times. That's what we're supposed to do. Well, and I had, let's get into Josh Wheeler up front because you did bring right. him up. Josh Wheeler, to the viewers, many of know, know who he is. He's a former Army Ranger, went to Delta Force, was killed in a what is a very famous hostage rescue mission where Pat Payne won the Medal of Honor and Josh oh. KI8 got the um the silver star. Could you tell our audience what your memories of just Josh as a human, Josh as a guy, like what was Josh Wheeler like? Uh Josh is probably one of the most influential people in my entire life as far as the military and being a man. Um there's a there's a few other, uh Bernie Felino and Chuck Albertson uh also are definitely up there, but Josh Wheeler was huge. And the reason was, is, is, you know, stuff that I already talked about. He came over to our platoon. He was my squad leader. Um, another uh, great ranger, uh, Casey Casvent, who was killed uh, uh, with Blackhawk when he was there. We were team leaders together. And our initial impression of Josh Wheeler was not good um, because he literally came into, uh, you know, at the time we had a, a barracks room on the bottom floor. That's where all the NCOs were. And Casey and I shared a room. And uh, Josh came in. I don't know remember it was like 4 30 in the morning kicked open our door and said team leaders are up before everybody else what the hell are you guys doing in bed and i remember casey you know he leaned over you know he like rolled over and he's like i, I ain't gonna fucking make it with this dude like it's 4 30 in the goddamn morning you know and uh anyway we got up and uh you know that was just josh man he was super intense um you know it, it mattered Every day mattered. Every every training, it didn't matter. There, there, there was no downtime. Um, you know, if we had time, we needed to be doing something. You know, weapons maintenance, you know, training, you know, CQB, you know, glass drills, um, you know, vehicle searches, you know, any kind of battle drill, not kind of bunker, anything. Like, you know, you don't need ranges to do this stuff. You have the quad, you have vehicles in the back parking lot. Like you can practice this stuff all the time. PT, if we're not, you know, doing training, like let's do two a days, you know, run in the morning hit the gym in the afternoon um and at first you know it was so different than what i was used to i was very turned off by it but you know just to add a little bit credence to it you know prior to josh coming i was the guy with the calendar on the wall literally you know 265 days till i'm out of the army like i could not wait to get out of the army like it was it was a done deal like and then you know you fast forward six months later I'd re-enlisted. I was a newly promoted sergeant, um, and I couldn't imagine doing anything else with my life, you know, and this is, you know, rolling into, you know, 2000 into 2001, you know, and, but yet that wasn't just all Josh was. Josh also was somebody that, you know, I did a lot of stuff in my off time with. We went hiking, we went mountain biking, we remodeled my kitchen, you know, we remodeled his kitchen together. You know, he had kids at the time. I didn't have kids at the time when we first met. Um, like we just... We did everything together and he was always like that, like always just a man on a mission, always a man on a task, you know, uh, let's do chores, you know, so he, he taught me a lot of stuff, you know, and I mean, I'm, I'm from the backwoods of Montana, so, but his just mentality about stuff was very, very different. Like, you know, I remember spending an entire block leave, you know, treeing, you know, cutting down trees in his backyard and my backyard and re- you know, re laying grass in my entire backyard, remodeling the entire kitchen and redoing part of my fence, you know, they got burnt and all this stuff. Like, you know, we spent the entire block leave doing it, you know, together and, you know, just going in between our houses. Like we, we spent a lot of time together and, you know, I seen how he, you know, interacted with his kids and his wife and, you know, and then just Rangers. And it was just, it was very different than anything I'd ever experienced. Um, and it, it made me go, okay, this is the man that I want to emulate. This is the man that I want to be like. And then as you know, Josh more and more, and you realize where he came from one, you know, he came very poor, um, you know, had, I think three or four sisters or brothers that, you know, he used to work, you know, he was terrible at school, but you know, he used to take any odd job that he could, you know, he would, 
you know, kill deer, you know, so that they had food on the table, but like he was the man of the house, you know, I don't don't remember if he was the oldest or not. I can't remember that, but he was definitely like the provider for his family. And, and then, you know, join the army again as a means to avoid mediocrity, but also to make money so he could send it back to his family, to his mom and stuff like that. And his sisters and brothers, um, and he actually didn't go to Ranger Regiment, you know, and a lot of people don't know that he was actually at 25th ID and he saw, you know, and he tells a story, you know, he told me a story that basically saw like Rangers running down the road. So he's like, who are these guys? And he like broke off from his formation, like getting yelled at by his squad leader and everything else. And he was trying to keep up with these Rangers, you know, like run with him because he's super competitive guy. Like I've watched that guy like run himself till he almost died just because he was trying to keep up with somebody, you know, doing whatever it was, you know, carrying a log or whatever it was. Cause we used to always just do, you know, kind of crazy things and he couldn't keep up with them. And he like damn near killed himself trying to keep up with these guys. And, you know, so when he got back and he linked up, he's like, who are those guys? Like who, who, who are those guys? Those are the Rangers down the street. Cause we were right, uh, right up the street from them, you know, 25th ID, that's where they used to be. Um, and he's like, I want to do that. And I can't remember if he went to Ranger School before Ranger Regiment or not. I can't remember that, but you know, it wasn't very long after that he was he was in Ranger Regiment. You know, so he actually was an import. And did you deploy with him once the war started? Yeah. So yeah, two thousand one, we were in Germany doing a training exercise when September eleventh happened, and I remember it. And it's a, I mean, obviously everybody remembers September eleventh. They remember where they were. We were actually getting ready to um, deploy into the box, into GMRC. So we're outside, like in Hohenfeld, and it was actually a really nice day. It was a really beautiful day, you know. Um, and so we're outside, which is unusual in Hohenfeld. Hohenfeld's like is, you know, it's just like any other NTC rotation or, you know, GMRC rotation. You know, the weather's always shit, you know, and it was actually a really nice day. And uh, we're outside, zero miles gear. XO comes out and says, hey, a plane hit the World Train Center. And we're like, that's freaking weird. Like, holy shit, you know, that's a kind of a random thing. Then comes out again, you know, a few minutes later and says, Hey, another plane hit the other world trade center. And then, you know, then everybody's like, okay, Hey, we're, you know, and that's when the conversation started. We're under attack, like all this different kind of stuff. So we, we started, you know, packing up miles gear. We're like, we're going to war. Like the America's at war. We're at war. And then, you know, so we're, we're like thinking, okay, there's no way we're going to go into the box. We're going to be doing something very different. And, you know, not long after, a couple hours later, they're like, nope, hey, you're still going into the box. And obviously, everybody was was pretty frustrated, pretty di- disappointed. Uh, but, you know, we got packed up, we got loaded up, we loaded on five tons, they dropped us off in the woods. And what's funny about it now, like thinking about it now is what I realize is, is that everybody was like scrambling and probably like glued to TVs and all this different kind of stuff. So they literally just dropped us off and told us to walk into the woods and wait, like set up patrol bases and wait, you know, and uh, we're like, screw that. You know, Josh was like, screw that. We're not doing that. So we literally like walked in the woods. We put a bunch of ponchos together. Uh, because it started raining, of course, you know, you're in the box. So of course it's going to start raining. And, uh, we all sat around it as a squad literally. And, uh, one of my guys, one of my saw gunners had, uh, one of those red cross wind up radios. You remember those? And, uh, we're listening, trying to listen to the news. And I think we managed to get in AFN, but not like very well. So we couldn't really understand what was going on. Like a little bit, we were catching bits and pieces and eventually we just kind of gave up on that. And uh, Josh, you know, so we're just sitting there and we're talking about it, you know, and I remember Josh and I'm, you know, I actually just talked to Sergio and I forgot to ask him about this, but, uh, you know, Sergio Chiperez, which was one of my uh, uh, 203 gunners, he was a teacher in his previous life between, before joining the military. He basically, Josh said, hey, everybody, you know, basically give like a paragraph of what you're thinking right now, you know, and, you know, Serge, you know, write it down you know, and, uh, so we did. And, uh, you know, I would love to reread those, um, one, because there's three individuals that were there at that time that are now dead. Um, so I'd love to see what they had to say, but then also, you know, I just love to think of kind of like the mentality, you know, the nativity of youth, you know, of what we were thinking at those times. Um, and then we went into the rotation and, uh, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, it was very hard. Um, and they tried to like change the scenario. And this just tells you like how stupid everybody was back then. 
they tried to change the scenario because they're like, you're going to go to the Middle East, you know, because now that's where everybody's focused on. And so all the role players were Arabic speakers. <laughs> they like changed them, you know, from East European, you know, Russian, you know, role players to like Middle Eastern, you know, role players was what they were trying to do, but it was Arabic. And it was like, well, I could speak Arabic in Afghanistan, <laughs> you know? So, you know, it's just one of those things, but, uh, yeah. So in 2002, sorry, I, I kind of long way of, uh, going around in 2002, um, you know, 375 deployed, 175 deployed, Roberts Ridge happened. And then about a month later after Roberts Ridge, 275 went on the first deployment. I was with Josh on that deployment. And if you wouldn't mind, what was Josh like in combat? Yeah. So that first deployment, honestly, you know, so we, we, we fly into the Island, um, you know, prior to going to Afghanistan and I mean, it, you know, Josh was super intense and I actually just recently shared a picture of us, you know, in, in, you know, the, the desert camo and everything else. And, you know, just Josh, cause he's, you know, intense guy. We took a squad photo and everybody's face is super somber on that, in that photo. And it's because Josh, right before we snapped that picture, he said, all right, let's take a picture, a squad picture real quick, because we're probably all not going to come back alive. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit. You know, so everybody's face is super somber, but, uh, you know, we get off the Island and Josh is like, you know, I remember us landing and he's like, all right, everybody keep their weapons on them. You know, when we get off, we're going to get into formation, you know, like everybody needs to have their eyes open and all this stuff. Cause we didn't actually know where we were landed. You know, everything was very, very, you know, kind of secretive back then. And then we get off and we realize we're at an air force resort, you know, people are walking around in fucking bikinis, you know, out tanning, you know, like there's a bar, there's like a canteen, you know, all this different kind of stuff. And they literally told us like, Hey, um, once you get to your tents, ground all your weapons, ground all your kit, everything else, don't carry that stuff around because it'll scare people. You know, and we're like, we're in a war zone. And then we realized like, no, you're actually not in a war zone, you know? And then, uh, I don't know, we actually weren't there very long. My squad wasn't, uh, for some reason on that first deployment, we got, uh, we got attached to third platoon a lot, um, for a lot, you know, I don't really totally know the reasons, but, uh, my squad went, you know, C-130 over to Afghanistan. And then, you know, that's when, okay, we're like, Hey, we're really going into Afghanistan. We're going into Bagram. But that deployment, by and large, outside of like a few incidents, was pretty um, benign. You know, there wasn't really a lot. Um, we took like indirect once and like maybe there was like some gunshots like off of the distance. But, you know, Josh never let us like let our guard down. You know, we yeah, sure. We would have times where we'd sit around and play spades or something like that. But, you know, Josh was always like, Hey, we're going to go out and patrol. You know, we're going to do all kinds of stuff. We're going to train. We're going to keep on training. We're going to keep on doing PT. We're going to improve, you know, cause his big thing was always chores, you know, like, man, we're going to get up and do chores, you know, so do PT, eat breakfast. And then now we're going to spend the day, you know, part of the morning doing chores, you know, so we'd be, you know, sandbags, Constantino wire, all different kinds of stuff, you know? Um, so he was intense, but at the same time, he was, he did have a calmness, you know, when, she, when, when things did go sideways, like, cause there was multiple incidents, you know, where, you know, we, you know, where we didn't know, like we were going through like villages and stuff like that, you know, you just don't know what you don't know, you know? And, um, you know, he was always calm. He was a very, very calm guy. He's very direct. Um, but you know, as far as a tactician goes, you know, there's none better. I had the opportunity to interview his squad leader or squadron leader at uh, when he went to Delta Force. And yeah. that guy told me, and, and I, I'm telling you this because I think that you'll appreciate it. He said one of the things that always fascinated him about Josh Wheeler was when they'd go into the kill house and yeah. do like the CQB training, he just would constantly be laughing. Like he'd be yeah. running these drills and oh, he'd yeah. be laughing his ass off while blowing oh, yeah. things away. And he, his squ former squadron leader said, he's like, I hope that when he died, he was smiling because that's how he would have wanted it. And he was a large, this is his squadron leader said, Josh Wheeler was a larger than life figure in an organization where everyone is a larger yeah. than life figure. He was elevated above virtually all of them. So I really appreciate you taking some time to remember Josh. Do you remember where you were when you heard that he'd been killed? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, yeah. Um, I was, uh, I was in, a uh, 400 Liggett. I was a first sergeant in Charlie company, uh, two, seven, five. 
and we were doing uh, validation exercises before deployment. And uh, so we were doing a brief. And uh, so the brief, you know, as we were getting ready to, you know, go out and do the first series of, you know, targets and stuff like that, you know, all our phones are outside, you know, on the, on the security point and everything. So we do the brief and I come up and it was one of my guys actually at security point. He goes, Hey, first sergeant, your phone's been blowing up. And I'm like, Oh shit. Okay, great. I'm like, I don't have that many guys on rear D like, God dang it. Like what the hell's going on? So I like pick up my phone and I see I have multiple missed calls from, you know, uh, guys in the unit. I'm like, Oh shit. Like I know where this, you know, cause you know, you just know, like there's a reason behind that. So I call Chris Frost, uh, who's you know a great friend of mine, great uh, great buddy of mine um, that I've known forever. Um, so I call him back, and I you know all I said was who, and he goes Josh, and you know I instantly went which one, you know because I do know you know quite a few Joshes, and he goes Josh Wheeler, and I don't quite frankly know what I said. Um, I don't even know if I hung up the phone with him. Um, I, I, I can't quite remember. Um, because I mean, we've all lost friends. We've all lost, you know, people important to us, you know, especially in this profession, but, you know, just like that squadron commander, you know, talked about there's people that are larger than life. And then there's people that are a cut above. Well, for Josh and maybe for many of us, there was Josh, like Josh dying was not possible. Like there's no way Josh could die. Like, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't want to sound like ignorant, ignorant. I don't want to sound like childish because I mean, that's the reality of the, the work that we do, but we, I, you know, we really, really felt that way. Cause I've seen Josh like almost die, you know, like numerous times, like, you know, there's no way that Josh could die. And, uh, you know, and I've, I've said this before, but I'll, but I'll say it again. And I'm not sure if I'm totally, you know, you probably just asked one question, but I'll go into it if you don't mind is, um, you know, I, I instantly went into, okay, I got to let other people know. So I started making phone calls, you know, I started telling people, Hey, you know, here's, here, you know, Josh is dead. You know, I don't know much, you know, all this different kind of stuff. And, um, the last call that I made um, was to somebody I've already referenced before, Sergio Chiperez, and it just all kind of finally just like caught up with me in that moment. And when I called Sergio, I couldn't talk; like I was crying, like and I was, and you know, again, I don't know. I think I, I mean, he told me like you got it out, but you know, because I've talked to him since, but he's like, I was worried. Like I, one, he's like, I was devastated just like you were, but I was worried. Cause you, I've never seen you like that. Um, and the next two days, man, I'll tell you, um, and it was very, very bad time to not be in your element, you know, not to not be functional, but I was not functional as a first arm. Um, cause we're going through a training exercise, you know, and good thing is I had phenomenal platoon sergeants and a company commander that I love to the day I die. Uh, John Stahely, Lieutenant Colonel John Stahely is currently a 191 commander over in uh, Graf, Germany. They covered for me pretty much. And uh, finally, you know, I went and I talked to the chaplain and, you know, it was, it was the start of me working through shit that I hadn't worked through, um, you know, in a long time, going all the way back to my childhood. And, uh, you know, so bringing this, you know, this, this, this kind of, you know, to a head right here is, is I, I like to think that in Josh's death, um, you know, he saved my life one last time, um, because had I not done that, I don't know where I would be. I was a pretty messed up individual. Like I had packed away years, decades of trauma and issues and everything else. And I finally got like help. And I finally did the things that I needed to do to work through those problems and to come to um, terms with a lot of things. But it took that. And it sucks that it took that. Um, quite frankly, um, I wish Josh was still with us. And, you know, uh, life would have went the way it went for me. Um, I, I would give anything to be able to call Josh right now. Um, and I think about that fucking daily. I would love to be able to talk to him, um, even if it's just some random, um, you know, email that I would get from him when he was traveling the world talking about, you know, his escapades up in Norway or whatever it was, you know, because and I say that because that was like the last email exchange we had 
was he was up in Norway. So, um, which was a couple months uh, prior to that. So, well, yeah. I think on behalf of not just the viewers, but the country, I think it's important people realize that Joshua Wheeler exists. They are more than willing to pay the price sacrifice that they do. And this country is better off for it. And if people don't know his story, I can't encourage you enough to Google it, read, read about it wherever you can watch interviews like this one. Cause Josh Wheeler was a great American and we're not going to forget him no matter how many years go by. So I cannot thank you enough. And we're going to get into a lot of things you just mentioned, but I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to really shine a light on the legacy of Joshua Wheeler. Next, I, I want to pivot because you did. This is the last specific one to Delta Force. And this is the one I wrote down earlier in the interview when you said you had retired in 2015. There's a former operator I've written about on a handful of occasions. I write about him pretty much every Memorial Day for the last several years. His name was Joshua Wheeler. He yeah. was killed in 2015 on that famous ISIS raid when yeah. uh, Thomas Patrick Payne earned the Medal of Honor. If you knew Joshua Wheeler at all, would you mind saying what your memories of him was and what kind of man he was? And if you didn't, not a big deal at all. But I figured maybe you two overlap given the timelines. We did. And we we overlapped at Second Ranger Battalion, too. So I, I knew I knew Josh when he was a young ranger. Um, and there there are some of these guys that are just larger than life. Right. Like, you know, a lot of the Delta guys are larger than life. Um some of them are, are the ultimate gray man. I mean, J Josh was one of those guys that was just, he was just larger than life. Like he just, he did it a little bit better than everyone else. Um, and he, he did it a little bit louder than everyone else. You know what I mean? It's like, but not like, not loud, like, like ego. He was just always having fun. Like you'd, he'd be laughing going through the shoot house. You know what I mean? He'd, he's laughing on target. I mean, I, I can almost guarantee you, I, I wasn't there. He was a squadron, same, you know, same squadron that I was with. I wasn't there, but, but I can, all, I can guarantee you there was laughter within somewhere happening in the middle of this, you know, or Josh going, can you believe this? You know what I mean? Like, let's get this, you know? Um, yeah, that one hurt a lot of guys. And I think a lot of guys are still emotionally and spiritually hurt over that one. Uh, I don't fully understand you know, what's happening with our guys where, where they're just, you know, they're killing themselves. They're, they're committing suicide. And, and it, it really started in the, 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 the military ranks and then it, it's moved into soft and it's, it's starting to hit, hit Delta. And, and, and it might be, I think I have some beliefs. I mean, what we didn't, we don't lose that many guys, you know what I mean? And I, the other, the other biggie though, is this sense of control. I think, I think trauma is very much tied to the lack of control. You know what I mean? So when you're a young soldier, that's why even these even these kids that have PTS that never went, were in a gunfight, it was just from mortars landing on, on the forward operating base. I don't dismiss that trauma because it's that lack of control. You know what I mean? And I and I I never felt in the unit, well, ever really, that I didn't have a fighting chance. You know, it's it's kind of like uh, even if it was a Butch and Sundance event, like when Butch and Sundance. You know, and that they they run out and the you know they, there's this Bolivian company, of, you know, like I think in their minds they're like we got a fighting chance, you know, and I and I always I always felt that way that we have a fighting chance, you know. I've never I've never felt so far behind the black ball that that um, that I ever felt out of control or fearful, um, and that's the one of the things that that I know with Josh, there was never a moment that he he just wasn't ready for the fight, you know, and and Pat. Um, when Pat came across the hall, he, his very first job was, was with me. I was his, I was his troop, his, uh, uh, troop commander. And he, I mean, he was a, he was a highly talented spot on kid. And it's, it's interesting to, for me now to see this wise sage medal of honor winner, Pat Payne, you know, where man, we busted his chops for months as the new guy, you know, um, and the other thing I would say is, while that is a deserved honor for Pat, those th that handful of men that were around him and around Josh are equally as heroic, if not even even more heroic. And those are names uh, that you'll never know. And I would like to, you know, the listeners to this, man, say a prayer. Thanks, 
to these men and women because a lot of us are retiring and retired now i if pat isn't retired he will he, be soon he, he, he's retired yeah yes okay you know all that that era of those guys you know they called them 911 babies so when 911 started for you know for 20 years from from 2001 and 2021 they they were fighting you know and so those those guys are are starting to retire and uh just yeah pray pray for peace pray for shalom for these guys pray for peace for a guy like pat payne carrying that medal of honor around your neck that is a heavy heavy lift without a doubt and i to the viewers the reason joshua wheeler has stood out to me i remember where i was the day joshua wheeler got killed i didn't know who he was i obviously i had zero connection I was sitting in the offices of my old job. I was sitting at a table in the middle of the room and my buddy Neil was sitting right next to me. It was early in the morning and MSNBC had flashed Joshua Wheeler's photo when he's in like his dress where he's got, you know, the medals and all that stuff. And they're like a U.S. serviceman has been killed in um, Iraq. I turned to my buddy and I said, I guarantee you, guarantee you that guy's in Delta Force. Guarantee mm -hmm. it. And at that time, there was no details. It was this guy's been killed on what they think was a, a, a rescue mission, which obviously turned out to be true. And then the New York Times, I believe, wrote kind of an in-depth dive. And they said the last thing Joshua Wheeler ever said, because, you know, the Kurds were getting overrun. The, the mission was not going well. He turned to the guys behind him and he said, follow me, the Kurds behind him. And he stepped through that breach and that's where he took that AK round that killed him. I believe it was an AK and that level of bravery to turn and just say, follow me. That is American exceptionalism at its absolute best. And I hope everyone watching this knows who Joshua Wheeler is. If you don't Google him and Pat Payne and everyone, I mean, just class, you can't and, beat him. And brother, th those are the same Kurds I was talking about in 2002. You know, some of them are the exact same men. Some of them are their children. You know what I mean? Some So, so th this, that was the thing that used to blow me away too, going back to Iraq and Afghanistan is linking back up with these guys. And I've been back to Iraq since in the counter, counter sex trafficking stuff. Um, they're still surviving, you know? So yeah, I, I agree with you. So yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll say it one more time, man. Say a prayer of thanks for men like Josh Wheeler and 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 women like josh wheeler because they fill our ranks and this idea that george orwell saying of you know uh, brave men stand on these walls that's why i sleep sleep peacefully at night that is no joke people there, there there are people there are men and women that are on these walls and they will climb off that wall and go into bad guy country just so you can sleep well at night and while sometimes we get resentful about it and sometimes we feel unappreciated Every single one of us would do it all over again. Amen. And and the I I now want to ask you a question as a Christian. Um, you know, like I said, you you wrote the book "Where Have All the Heroes Gone," which you know, the fact anyone can write a book to me is incredible. I don't think I could ever write a book, so that's wildly impressive. But as a Christian, one of the questions I I find fascinating when I interview someone who's gone to war and is also a Christian, what do you say to people who might say? You can't kill people. You can't believe in combat. You can't go to war. And at the same time, call yourself a follower of Christ. What would your response be to anyone who might suggest that? 